In this lecture, we will survey the literary context for realism and naturalism with William Dean Howells and Edith Wharton. William Dean Howells was born and raised on the frontier in Ohio, where he helped his father, a newspaper publisher and printer, from an early age. Although he was largely self-educated, he wrote newspaper articles as a teen in Columbus and Cincinnati, and by the time he was 21, he was working as a city editor for the Ohio State Journal. Afterwards, he moved to the East, where he continued to pursue this career in printing, publishing, journalism, and fiction, and met a number of American luminaries, including Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau. Hawthorne actually approved so well of Howells that he gave him a note to pass on to Emerson, which read, I find this young man worthy. He was one of the first important Western writers to emigrate to the publishing centers in New England, and in 1866, at the age of 29, he moved to Boston and became the assistant editor for the Atlantic Monthly, which is the most prestigious magazine in America at the time. Shortly after, at the age of 34, he became the magazine's editor, a position he held for the next 10 years. In this position and others that followed, he became known as the Dean of American Letters, an arbiter of literary tastes and goals. He revived interest in great talents, including Herman Melville and Emily Dickinson, names that are widely known today, but that had been forgotten or overlooked in their own time. He served as a champion and mentor for a generation of young writers, including Hamlin Garland, Sarah Orne Jewett, Mary E. Wilkinson, Freeman, Charles Chestnut, Frank Norris, and Stephen Crane. He was also the friend and confidant of other literary giants of his time, including Mark Twain and Henry James. Howells is known as the champion of literary realism, realism being, as mentioned in the lecture on Ambrose Bierce, a literary aesthetic developed in America during the postbellum decades that strives to give a faithful representation of reality. As Howells said, quote, Realism is nothing more and nothing less than the truthful treatment of material. Now, the 19th century is the century where we see the camera invented and popularized, and like the camera, realists felt they should present the world as it actually is. So we might take a moment here to distinguish between realist verisimilitude, or the semblance of reality, and local color veritism, or the impression of reality, which is discussed in our lecture on Charles Chestnut, Kate Chopin, and Sarah Orne Jewett. Even as we might suggest that realist literature is more objective than local color literature, it's important to recognize that realist literature is still a narrativized account of reality, and just as a photograph exhibits the frame of an artist's intent and direction, a realist story exhibits the frame of an author's purpose and motivation. For instance, whereas we might argue that a purely objective representation of a society would give no special focus to a specific character, instead giving a snapshot of a crowd and scene and offering no real real interpretation of it, realist literature instead focuses on a single individual facing a conflict or conflicts that conveys poetic, political, or even moral meaning. Now this character is still a representative, ordinary character to be sure, facing ordinary, everyday conflicts narrated in a plain and sensible way. But this kind of realism differs even from local color fiction, which as we've mentioned before, is a subgenre of realist literature. And whereas local color places greater emphasis on illustrating the character of a region, and therefore can be devoid of plot, realist literature otherwise places emphasis on illustrating the character of society by following the development of an individual. And because we're following the development of an individual, we often get to hear the thoughts of the character and enter the character's head, as we did with Ambrose Bierce's An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. For Howells, realist literature had to be democratic, that is, not only focus on the ordinary and commonplace, but participate in the development of the nation's ethics. That is, to Howells and many other authors of many periods, writing is a moral act. But for Howells, this moral act begins with truthful representation, because he felt real people are moral. And realist literature presents situations that real people can relate to, that helped bring focus to the difference between, as he said, quote, what is right and what is wrong, what is noble and what is base what is health, and what is perdition. On the other end, focusing a story on individual experiences allowing readers access to characters' thoughts, for instance, also makes a text more democratic in that it helps give readers greater freedom in coming to their own conclusions about a text. This is opposed to being dictated to or having the morals spelled out by the narrator or author as it had been in literature of the past. Howells is especially known for not just leading the realist movement, but condemning romantic literature in what is sometimes called 
the realism war, a conflict between critics and writers who debated over the merits and demerits of each aesthetic, romanticism and realism, siding with realism Howells accused romanticism of promoting the, quote, ethics of a savage, with gaudy heroes and heroines that were essentially stock figures, presumably noble, beautiful, and glorious, but in actuality reprehensible victims to their own passions and obsolete codes of conduct and ideals. Thus, like Ambrose Spears, Howells rejected the fanciful, sentimental, and melodramatic glorifications of topics like love and war. One good example of Howell's political activism was his involvement in the labor movement. In the late 19th century, laborers fought for greater rights in the face of an increasingly industrializing nation. They wanted to limit workdays to just eight hours. In response, employers instituted anti-union measures, fired and blacklisted union members, locked out workers, recruited strike breakers, and so forth. Before the 19th century, labor laws allowed for 10 to 16-hour workdays. By the end of the 19th century, it was more typical to work 10-hour workdays with a six-day work week, and laborers wanted to keep this progress going and gain protection from further exploitation. On May 4, 1886, laborers were striking in Chicago in favor of the eight-hour workday as well as against police brutality which had been displayed a day prior against their protesters when someone who was never identified threw a bomb at the police and the police opened fire on the crowd. Chaos ensued. Eight people died and eight rioters known for their radicalism were arrested and tried for murder, seven of whom were then sentenced to death. Howell sent a letter to the editor of the New York Tribune urging readers to petition the governor of Illinois, asking him to commute the rioters' sentences. And for standing up for them, he was vilified and became a figure of public scorn. Even his friends refused to help. Of the convicted men, one committed suicide, two were commuted to life in prison, and four were executed. Howells was also involved in the anti-imperialist movement in America, objecting against the Spanish-American War, which is the subject of our short story, Editha. Alongside others like Mark Twain, he cautioned that the Spanish-American War was America's initiation to the shameful legacy of imperialism inherited from Europe. He felt that the war was just a colonial venture justified by the rhetoric of the white man's burden, that is, the idea that it is the white man's moral duty to bring culture and enlightenment to non-white people around the world. The central issue at the heart of the Spanish-American War was the question of Cuban independence from Spain, which had won the hearts of Americans who felt that the Cuban Revolution paralleled the American Revolution. However, the war was also inspired by racism against Spain, as well as goals of expansionism. In fact, as a result of the Spanish-American War, the U.S acquired temporary control of Cuba and ownership of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippine Islands, making critics question whether this was indeed a righteous war. Howells wrote in favor of women's rights as well, calling American society a, quote, hospital for invalid women, a place where women were corralled into roles and positions that oppressed and bound them, leaving them idle and aimless. Furthering this critique is Edith Wharton, our second author of Focus in this lecture. Wharton-born Edith Newbold Jones was the third child and only daughter of an elite conservative old New York family. Before she was 10, her wealthy family had traveled with her to Rome, Spain, France, Germany, and back to Florence. And throughout her childhood, the family would juggle their time between New York and Europe, with summers spent in Newport. Port, Rhode Island. Despite such worldly experiences, her formal education was a bit lackluster, as was typical for girls of her time, even for those raised in the upper class. She was tutored at home and lived a sheltered life. She showed brilliance and creativity at a young age, writing a novella entitled Fast and Loose at the age of 15, which displayed precocious criticism of high society, a theme she'd carry on into her later works, but she didn't publish it. At the age of 17, heartened by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's encouragement, that is the author who wrote Paul Revere's Ride, she she submitted several of her adolescent works to the prestigious Atlantic Monthly, where they were then published. However, as the years edged on, she found it increasingly difficult to continue writing. The roles and expectations of a woman in her station demanded much time and attention. She ended up debuting at the age of 17, as was usual for the time, and then marrying shortly after at the age of 23 to a man 13 years her senior, again conventional for the time. The marriage wasn't a happy one. Her husband, Edward Teddy Wharton, wasn't particularly witty or artistic and had few intellectual interests. They grew distant. She also tired of the duties of being a society matron, entertaining, decorating, supervising servants, and she turned to writing as an outlet, finally picking up the pen again in her mid-thirties. During this time, her husband's mental health also began deteriorating. He cheated on her, she had an affair with a younger man named Morton Fullerton, and in 1913 she filed for divorce, which was awarded based on her husband's adultery. 
Over the course of her life, she met various important figures, including those influential to the development of realist and naturalist literature, such as Henry James, one of her closest friends and mentor, William Dean Howells, Hamlet Garland, and Charles Darwin. She became a best-selling author in the early 20th century, received the Pulitzer Prize in 1921, and in 1923 became the first woman to be honored by Yale University with a Ph.D. Despite all this, she fell from the limelight after her death and was only rediscovered during the 1960s as academics sought greater clarity into the women's movement of the late 19th and early 20th century. Although she's considered a disciple of James, her work should also be recognized for participating in the women's literary tradition of the 19th century, shaped before and after her by such renowned authors as Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, Sarah Orne Jewett, Kate Chopin, Willa Cather, and Gertrude Stein. The main issues Wharton engaged in often included those concerning the frustrations and limitations facing women, particularly of the upper class, for instance, questions of marriage and divorce, the repression of women's sexuality, especially those of the upper class, the desire of middle class women for respectable paid work, rivalry among women, and so forth. William Dean Howells and Edith Wharton were both criticized by naturalists. Naturalism is a literary movement that may be considered an offshoot from realism, but naturalists criticized realists for ignoring the truth. Whereas romantics might criticize realists for focusing on the vulgar and commonplace, naturalists criticized realists for avoiding subjects that are truly indecent, disturbing, and sickening, for instance, the people and experiences of the slums. As William Dean Howells himself said, when describing what realists should write about, authors should avoid, quote, certain facts of life that are not usually talked of before young people and especially young ladies, seemingly suggesting that they should avoid offensive and obscene material. We know that what he meant by this, as mentioned earlier, is that intrigues and tragedy are mere cheap effects, the stuff that arrests our fascination and feeds our guilty pleasures, but doesn't serve the higher function of literature, which is, according to Howells, to comprehensively illustrate all of human nature, including everything that goes beyond the seemingly one-note idealism of romanticism, and on the other hand, the seemingly one-note cynicism of naturalism. So let's give some clarity to what naturalism is. Like realists, naturalists emphasize depicting reality as it truly is. However, unlike realists, naturalists developed a rather pessimistic, deterministic outlook on life. Inspired by the rise of the sciences at the end of the 19th century, naturalists in literature strove to present reality without illusion, to offer a scientific and detached view. But the sciences were increasingly suggesting that humans are not special, that they're just another rung on the ladder of life, no different from animals. And so Emile Zola, perhaps the most renowned naturalist writer, claimed we are nothing more than human beasts to be studied. Now, the concept of an animal carries significantly negative tones at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. The animal is a brute dominated by base passions like lust and greed, and so naturalism studies the manifestation of this brute self within the human being, examining the ways characters struggle to maintain that false face of civilization. This pessimistic view of humans was exacerbated by the popularization of Darwin's theories on evolution. Herbert Spencer, a biologist and sociologist, used Darwin's theories to explain his own views on society and economy, coining the phrase survival of the fittest and perpetuating the dog-eat-dog -dog world vision of naturalism. In another way, Darwin's theories also caused many to doubt whether humankind could progress. Thomas Huxley, a biologist known in his day as Darwin's bulldog, insisted that biological evolution does not necessarily entail moral and social evolution, meaning that as time passes, cultural progress is not a given. In fact, he argued biological evolution demands the regression and degeneration of culture and morals, passions like lust and greed necessarily leading to war, poverty, racism, and the like. Taking this line of thought, naturalists perceived humans as constantly at war, not just between each other, in a fight for survival, but within themselves as well. The push for an objective, detached approach to life and literature, one that sees humans as decentralized, or as we said earlier, just another rung on the ladder of life, also resulted in the imagining of nature as indifferent. In this case, while humans may be naturally inclined towards cruelty, compelled by their brute natures and instincts for survival, nature, as in the world and creatures beyond man, is neither beneficent or treacherous, kind or cruel. This results in plot structures that pit humans against the forces and beasts of nature, but in 
all of these conflicts, man against man, man against self, and man against nature, man never wins. Naturalists seek to depict a world that reveals how futile human activity can be, that regardless of how much struggle we put in, it may very well add up to little or nothing. Thus, unlike romanticism and realism, which focus on the individual and his or her capacities, naturalism seeks to show humans as at the mercy of larger forces that originate inside and outside themselves. In short, in naturalism, characters are typically, but not always, lower class, the story is typically, but not always, set in the city, and the plot may potentially feel a bit extraordinary since they seem to invariably end badly for the main characters.